we're talking about the home uh, building industry and the fact that it can commonly overshoot the need that a marketplace uh, has. And there are many industries that overshoot um, the need and go through, through a cyclical, uh, cyclical um, uh, industry, basically, a cyclical economy. So what we saw here, and let's just go through this slowly, we saw the graph go up and it overbuilt. It went through the 10,000 houses. So if you, look at, if you look at the model, what happened is the builders perceived the gap based on the number of people that did not live in houses. So it took the finished houses and compared that with the population, whatever that is, the population, to determine the gap, and it built based on that gap. The reality is that gap was already in the process of being filled by the work in progress. So essentially they were using a metric that had a 12-month delay on it, to determine the need in the marketplace. And what they should have done is taking a look at the work in progress as well. Now, you might think this is straightforward, but sometimes uh, th this is a whole industry. So you might be a new builder. You don't have that much knowledge of what your competitors might be doing, where they're investing, where they're trying to get zoning permits, where they're trying to you know, buy up at neighborhoods, that sort of that sort of thing. So what you need to do is kind of perceive what is in progress plus what's available and compare that with the gap. And so if you're using a lagging metric, like the number of finished houses, you may uh, be incorrectly uh, putting together your investment. So the, sim the, uh, the solution is relatively simple. Uh, it's just a change in the way you perceive the gap, or the way you calculate the gap. So Instead of just using the finished houses, we're going to add the finished houses plus the work in progress houses, and that is going to determine what the um, you know what need is being filled. You're going to compare that against your goal and build based on the, the then what gap you see. Okay, so we're just going to add houses work in progress in our calculation of the gap and see whether that uh, indeed fixes the problem. So let's go to a cell. Uh, let's make that change and take a look model as it looked at the end with the oscillation and um, and the problem that it doesn't end with the right number of houses. Let me get this out of the way. So at the board we talked about fixing that by calculating the gap differently. Where is the gap? Need for houses. Okay. So basically we would calculate the gap uh, population minus not just the finished houses, which is C13, but also uh, take into account the houses that are being built. Okay, it doesn't make a difference in the beginning, but we're looking at C13, the finished houses, plus the whip houses, and taking the population minus that, and that is the gap. Okay, let's see if that fixes it. That was a simple change. Um, Go down to row 16. Okay, we'll scroll down. There we go. Well, that fixed one problem. Uh, you could see now we smoothly, we don't oscillate, we don't overshoot the number of houses. Um, we basically stabilize at 7,000 houses. Uh, which is a little strange because we wanted to have uh, 10,000 houses. So what we'll do is let's go back to the board and discuss uh, what we can do, why, that, why we have that problem, and what we can do to resolve it. Okay, so for some reason we stopped the oscillation. Okay, now we perceive the gap correctly. We take into account the houses that are done, the houses that somebody else is building, that us as the industry are building, and we only build for that remaining gap. So that stabilizes, so we don't overshoot anymore, but for some reason we end at a smaller number of houses than is necessary. Well, the, the problem is really we're not taking into account, at least in real time, the, um, the decay of houses. And so I can give you an analogy uh, that's easy to understand. Let's say you have a, you know, a project that needs a 100-person team. 
and you really need the team to be uh, at 100 people at all times to complete this project on time. If you have an attrition rate, so let's say uh, you have a 12% attrition rate, to just keep things straightforward, so meaning you have a one person leave, or yeah, 8% attrition rate, so one person leaves per, uh, per month. Uh, so 12 people leave, is that 8%? No, 12%, sorry, 12% attrition rate. You have one person leave per month. So essentially you have a little bit of a leaky bucket in a sense and the people are leaving, which is kind of natural. And let's say it takes you three months to hire uh, the average person. If you wait till somebody leaves and then you start the process of writing a job description, recruiting, and then filling that, that, uh, that person. Um, and then in the three months that you went to fill that person, two more people left because one person is leaving every... Uh, every month, then you are always going to be at under 100 people. Okay, so if you're always exactly reactive to the back end, um, noticing that somebody has left, and then cranking up the hiring process and taking three months to do it, you'll be at if you know intuitively kind of 97, uh, 97 people instead of the 100 people that you want. So to fix that problem, you have to recognize in advance at equilibrium at your goal 100 you're going to have a person leave per month. So you at least have to hire one person a month even if you have, um, even if there's no job openings, uh, even, if, even if your team is fully staffed. So you always have to have a hiring process on the front end that equals the leaving process on, on the back end. So that's kind of a minimum. So going back to this model, at, the, at equilibrium, you'll have 10,000 finished houses. And so you'll have kind of 10,000 divided by 36 that decay every year. That's kind of the end of the process. So, and, and I think that's 200 and some. Let's say it's 270. I'll figure it out in a second. Um, so back here in the building process, at a minimum, you should build that many. So you should never let the need, the gap, all that other stuff get you below that that number. So you can kind of set a minimum. It's sort of like the hiring example. At a minimum, let's hire one person a month, no matter what. No matter what, at a minimum, you should be hiring, you should be building what's going on at the back end. So that's an easy way to visualize this chain of stock and flows. At least, if there's going to be a back end process that's, that's decaying, uh, and you want to reach an equilibrium of 10,000 houses, at a minimum in the front end uh, process, at least do what's coming out of the back, uh, the back end. Okay, so now we'll adjust our model to have a minimum uh, hiring, uh, sorry, a minimum building uh, based on this uh, decaying and see whether that fixes that, uh, that second problem with our model. Okay. Okay, so back to our uh, model. You can see it ends at the 7,000 uh, houses. And let's just... Okay, you can see the building process at the end See, they drop down to building 196 houses. And what we wanted to do, I'm just going to calculate it as a constant. So minimum building. This should be our goal. So you got to do this at equilibrium. So our goal is to have 10,000 houses. The decay is 36 a month. So at a minimum, we should be building this 278 houses. So min, minimum build. OK. So I'm just going to change this. Whenever you have a minimum, you actually use a max function. As non-intuitive as that is. Oops. One more parenthesis. Okay, so we want max of that or that. Oh, come on. <laughs> Man, let me get all rid of all these stupid parentheses. Okay, max of that and that. Okay. Okay, so we're still going to build 3,000 at the beginning, but I imagine. In the end, we're going to at least stick to that 278. Okay. So let's 
looks different now. So we never drop below that 277.8. There we go. So that's a much smoother approach to the 10,000. And at equilibrium, it would end at 10,000. So you could do probably more intelligence there if you want than just having a minimum, you know, to try and get to that 10,000 faster or what have you. Um, but that's an easy way to think about it. When you have this chain of stocks and flows um, it, and you want an equilibrium, at least uh, have the inflow equal the outflow at the equilibrium and don't let it drop, uh, drop below that. Okay, good. I think we have a fixed uh, model there. Um, we have a encountered, we have dealt with the delay, we stop the oscillation, we end at the right, uh, the right goal and have a little bit of advice for the building industry. So I'll close up on the board and then we'll be done with this uh, particular series. Great, I'm going to end this series where we started uh, with this causal loop uh, diagram. You can see a relatively simple model where um, a population need number of houses you have drives a need to build houses that inspires the building industry to build houses and that basically balances it all out you have the number of houses and it's this delay here that wreaks all the havoc that causes the building industry to overbuild based on their incorrect perception of the need and uh... and basically they get into this oscillation uh... mode this is a dampening oscillation, so it eventually re re reaches an equilibrium. We had a little bit of problem with the aging of houses and forgetting to at least proactively build what was aging, so we fixed that. Uh, but essentially, a relatively simple balancing loop that a delay kind of wreaked a little bit of havoc uh, on it. Now, um, you might think this is a strange, uh, a strange case. But the reality is that most of these links are information links. So the building industry is thinking, what is my need? And making a decision about how much they should build. So it's really an information link. What uh, information are they using to make their decisions? And the reality is most metrics that we use as leaders to make decisions are lagging metrics. They are... Um, they are metrics that do, n do not take into account current activity. It's, you know, last year's market, uh, market size or customer satisfaction ratings based on the last uh, 12 months or uh, a, competitor, a competitive move that they may have put in place uh, months before. You just noticed it six months later. So many metrics that we use as leaders are lagging indicators. They are a representative of maybe a year ago uh, actuality. And so we need to be careful that we uh, take into account both that metric but also current activity since that metric was was accurate to make our make our decisions. So this notion of a lagging indicators most of what we deal with uh, for the good metrics at least in our our, uh, our kind of industry. So you need to add as many leading indicators as possible. Uh, so metrics that look forward or have current activity uh, built in there. And you need to know when you're using a lagging metric to make any adjustments uh, to that. Uh, so, um, so this is a good example. The, the home building industry was looking at demand, how many people weren't in houses, uh, but they should have realize that that's a lagging metric, that other people have taken action on that metric and started the process of solving, uh, solving the problem. So I hope that, was, uh, hope that was helpful. Careful the metrics that you use. Hopefully you learned a little bit about uh, how to model uh, delays and system dynamics with a chain of uh, stocks like that. And um, I guess that's it. I'll talk to you uh, next time. Bye.